this is going to be my 13th Boston, um, 12 prior actually on the course, 11 prior on the course. The so one year was uh, the virtual Boston. Um, <clears throat> everything else I think you need to know about me is there. Right, so a uh, little about me. Um, I coach for the Dashing Whippets and uh, we're a run club in New York and we're bringing several uh, folks to Boston and we also have a Boston chapter, so they'll be as there as well. Um, and I did set my uh, marathon PR on in Boston last year, 2022. Uh, and so I do like people to know that it is possible to PR in Boston. I know a lot of times you'll hear it, you know, Boston isn't a PR course, things like that. It's, it, it is possible to PR there. You have to work a little bit harder um, than, than elsewhere, but if you run smartly, um, then, then it's possible. And certainly if you take the advice in this presentation, uh, you'll be a step ahead. So here's the agenda. This is what we plan to cover. The expo will be first, then race morning logistics, the course mile by mile and post-race, and then the Q&A there, as I mentioned at the end. And Paul, go over the expo. Very good. The, um, the Boston Marathon Exposition, most of the time is at the Heinz Convention Center. It is this year. Uh, there was one recent year, I think it was 2018, and it was not there. Most of the time it is there. The Heinz Convention Center is, as you can see, it's part of the larger Prudential Center um complex um it, it's circled there i think in green or red uh that's the heinz convention center um i usually stay at the sheraton which you can see is right below the heinz convention center so the sheraton hotel is, a, is attached to the prudential center mall other hotels uh are nearby and attached to that same complex the um the boston marriott the weston hotel is nearby uh, the Mandarin Hotel and others. Um, <clears throat> there are security checkpoints at the entrances and there are two entrances to the Heinz Convention Center. One is on Boylston Street at the top of the, the photo just above where it says Heinz Convention Center and at the bottom attached, that's actually the T stop, we're not there yet. Um, the, the, other the other entrances at the Prudential Center area, everything in purple is the mall complex. The reddish colors are the attached hotels and orange is the Heinz Convention Center. The easiest way to get there, if you're not walking either through the Prudential Center from one of the nearby hotels um, <clears throat> or some other area is to take the T. There are three T stops nearby. The Heinz Convention Center T stop is fairly close. It it's deceptively looks closer than it is. It's not there. There's an arrow, as you can see, it's actually a couple of blocks away. The one that's actually in the mall is the Prudential Center. Uh, T stop at the bottom. And these are all on the green line. And then the Copley stations uh, stop is a few blocks away. Um, so the, the taking the T is definitely the easiest way to get around. <clears throat> the convention center times, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you can see them there. I won't read them all to you, just uh, but do know that you see the expo, the Heinz Convention Center at the right of this graphic. And there's more to do than just go to the expo. Of course, you've got the merchandise and the photo opportunities and so on at the expo, but nearby the finish line on Boylston Street um, and the Fan Fest, which is new in the most recent years, uh, right there at Copley Square. And the Fan Fest is where there are, they've got scheduled events going on, lots of nice giveaways and um, talks and events with experts and elite athletes and so on. So if you want to go see elite athletes, li listen to them, sometimes there's things scheduled over there. So just check the materials that they send to you about those events. Be prepared for crowds. Those of you who've run large races like Chicago, New York, Berlin, London, Tokyo, and other very large races, you're used to crowds like this. Uh, Boston is equal as far as crowd size, actually a little bit smaller, but everybody's crammed into what seems like a much smaller area. That what you're looking at is the entrance, the Boylston Street entrance to the expo at the convention center. And be prepared for crowds. If you walk along Boylston Street on 
Fridays or Saturday, especially, and on Sunday, very much so. The streets are extremely crowded. So you're shoulder to shoulder with people on the sidewalk going up and down Boylston Street. And the street is open to traffic. So be sure to obey the crosswalk uh, signals when you're crossing Boylston Street. So it's barricaded all along the street except for the crosswalks. And there are usually traffic cops. And the Boston cops aren't so... Uh, nice about people crossing the street they don't i haven't seen anybody get picketed but they definitely will yell at you if you're crossing against the light okay once you're inside the uh the convention center at the expo just follow the signs there's signs all over the place volunteers telling you where to go uh just follow the crowd it won't be a mystery but when you go to the packet and pick up you need to take your id with you you'll get your digital passport that you can carry on your iphone or your 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 mobile phone um, and you have to pick up your own packet you can't have someone pick up your packet for you so you got to go get it yourself once you've done that then you will get your shirt like the one that i'm wearing blue shirts are the even numbered years and yellow shirts are the odd number years. So I, if they stick to that, which they usually do, you'll be getting a yellow shirt this year. Once you're inside the expo, large exhibit space with lots and lots of vendors. Uh, best advice about going to the expo, if you can, if you're there early enough, go early, like Friday. Saturday morning is usually pretty good. Sunday morning is also, also pretty good. The heaviest times are Saturday afternoon, and Sunday afternoon, very, very crowded. Um, also nearby on Newberry Street, which is a block north of Boylston Street, parallel to Boylston Street, Newberry Street, there are lots of pop-ups. So vendors will have pop-ups alongside Newberry Street and there's lots of places to go. And also a lot of the things that you can buy in the expo, you can also buy it nearby Marathon Sports and other, other vendors, uh, that have storefronts all along Boylston Street and nearby. You do want to finish, go to the finish line. Um, and by the way, the folks that I'm coaching, I've posted information about that on, on the Revelers page and emailed it to everyone I'm coaching about the time that we're meeting to get a group photo. If you go out at any other time, that's fine. Just go as early as possible because it does get extremely crowded on the after, on Saturday afternoon and on Sunday afternoon on Boylston Street, people trying to get a picture of themselves on at the finish line. So don't wear your legs out like this dog. Okay, let's move on to race morning. Race morning, gear check and buses to the start. That's what we're gonna talk about. It's really not as complicated as some people think that it is, but you do need to be prepared for about an hour long ride from where the buses pick you up to the athlete's village. And what you're going to bring with you is the personal item bag. And we'll show you a photo of what that looks like. That's everything you want to carry with you. Throw away clothing. Uh, obviously, if the weather's bad, you've got lots of extra clothing. And it's not stuff that you can put into a bag once you're on the bus and get it later because it is throwaway stuff. Um, once you've boarded the bus, the only thing you've got is that personal item bag to carry things in and anything that you're wearing. Old shoes is a good idea. Kristen has brought this up that she usually wears an old pair of shoes, ties them around her neck. Once she gets to the athlete's village, uh, she wears those around. And when she's ready to start the race, she changes her shoes and puts on her racing shoes. So that's another thing to maybe do. Uh, and then finally, everything you plan to race with, your gels. Now, they do have Martin gel on the course, but if you've got your own types of gels or hand carry bottle or something like that, you need to bring it with you. Looking again at the buses and where the gear check is, um, they, the, the gear check is not in the, oh, I need to talk about the bags. This is the bag that you will get at the expo. The one on the left, that was 2012, the bag was orange. And now they're clear bags after 2013, the bombing, the bags are clear. Um, you, this is the only bag you can use. They won't accept any other bags. You can't bring your own backpack or any other type of bag. You've got to use this clear bag. They will give you a number in your packet when you pick it up and you have to use that number and just stick it on your bag. <clears throat> the pre-printed sticker. You can't take it with you on the bus. So when you drop, if you don't plan to check a bag and lots of people don't, you know, you've got friends or family who are going to meet you somewhere and have your clothes with you, that's fine. If you are going to check a bag, you check it at the gear at the, the bag check buses 
and then you load the, you board the bus with your personal item bag, not with this one. This is the one gallon clear plastic bag that they give you to carry on the bus. And you can only carry food items or sport drink in there. Obviously, you can carry gels and other things like that. But this is it. And this is a closer look at that bag. That's it. That's all you can carry with you. Now, that having said that, the year that the weather was really bad, 2018, they did allow people to bring um, ponchos, rain jackets and things, extra pairs of shoes. I did bring an extra pair of shoes with me that year and I didn't stick them around my neck because everything was getting soaked. I put them in another plastic bag and they let people carry those bags onto the bus with them. This is where the gear check is located. I'm sorry, the bus loading is located. The gear check you can see is right there on Boylston Street. Just to get your bearings, the finish line is on the left side of the photograph. You see where it says finish line, that's Boylston Street. The gear check bag is on Boylston Street and a street running perpendicular there, which I think is Berkeley Street. Um, and the buses, the school buses are just lined up on the street and you just drop, drop your bag uh, on the bus that corresponds to your bib number. The buses have signs on them that say you know, bib numbers, you know, fit 12,000 to 12,500. And you go to the appropriate bus, hand it to the volunteers who are on the buses through the window, and they take your bag. Then you walk uh, about a quarter mile uh, east along Boylston Street over to the Boston Common to the bus loading. And that's where the bus loading occurs. It's a very orderly process, but they do strictly enforce these bus loading times. So it depends on your wave. You can see the times there. This I'm not going to repeat it all because it's all in the materials that you'll get. But if you show up early, like, for example, you're in wave three and your bus loading time begins at 815. If you show up with a friend at 730 and say, well, I want to go out to the athletes village early. They won't let you in. They won't even let you near the buses because it's controlled at the bottom of that graphic where you see the yellow arrow on Boylston Street, they won't let you, they won't even let you in there. So you can't get in until it's the appropriate time for your wave to board. If you missed your wave, uh, yes, you can get on. They'll see, if you show up at uh, 730 and you 745 and you've got a red bib, they'll let you on. They just won't let you on if you've got a later boarding time. All right, once you're on the buses, be prepared, as I mentioned, for about hour, about an hour long ride. You can see at the top right is Boston and the area, the Boston Common is the area where you load the buses. At the bottom left is Hopkinton, where the race starts. And you can see in the middle, it says it's a 46 minute drive. And that's a drive, 40.9 miles. Um, that's driving this route. And this is the route that the buses take. They go along this highway, then they turn south, southeast, and then they go below Hopkinton and come up the other direction. They approach Hopkinton from the south. And it says 46 minutes. Um, and that's on a good day. So it's at least an hour to get there. And yes, they are school buses. So no porta potties on the buses. The Athletes Village is actually a little bit south of Hopkinton. And we're going to take a closer look at that where the Athletes Village is located. Once you get there, be prepared for somewhat long wait. You're sitting outside, maybe under tents. And I say maybe, there are, there are tents there, but there are not much room. There's water, uh, Gatorade um, available, Martin gels. You'll see the tent where they're giving out the Martin gels and you just get in line and they'll only give you one. Um, and portable lots and lots of portable toilets. Um, the famous... Welcome to Hopkinton and all starts here sign in the athletes village so don't check your phone if you want a picture. Um, and it's a simple procedure you line up you've got your phone with you, and you hand your phone to the person in line behind you. You walk up to the sign they take a picture of you you thank them you get your phone and off you go and by the same token the person in front of you has handed you their phone, you take their picture and so on. it's just a nice orderly process but if you want that picture. Be sure to take your phone with you. Um, there are very crowded uh, areas all over the Athletes Village. There are long lines. It's hard to move around, so you just have to be patient. This is an aerial view of what the area looks like. The, um, it's at the Hopkinton Middle School and the Hopkinton High School, the fields next to those schools. At the top of the photo is the middle school with the whitish roof. The darker roof at the bottom is the high school. You can see the fields 
and the tents next to the middle school, the one at the bottom doesn't look like that anymore. It's not a field anymore. It's been paved since then. And so it's now a paved parking lot and it's mostly full of just toilets. And this is what it looks like now. This is the actual uh, graphic from the Boston website. Now you can see that the uh, middle school's in the middle of the photo towards the top of it in the high school at the bottom. And you can see that field to the left of the high school is no longer a field. It's a parking lot with portable toilets. And these are the areas of the athletes village. The buses arrive on the, where it says, oh, this is a photo of me and Kristen last year at the athletes village on arrival. So here's where the arrival is. The buses pull up either in the front of the schools and drop you off where it says runner bus drop off there or they enter at the bottom where it says VIP and, char and charity runner drop off and they drive alongside that road and they unload on the left side of the photo where it says runner bus drop off. So you're either gonna, if you don't have a choice, they just go where they go and they either drop you off in front of the schools or behind the schools. Now, the interesting thing about that, if you look at this aerial photo is again, the buses are entering or dropping off on the right or the left side, unloading in the front of the back of the school. And then the runners walk along these pathways towards this choke point that exists right there. The runners who are coming, if you're dropped off in the front of the school, and most of the runners who are dropped off in front of the school will walk that direction towards that choke point, they'll see the large athletes village to the right, and they'll head that direction. The runners who are dropped off on the left side, they'll walk out, and the first thing they see is a giant parking lot full of porta potties on the right, and then the rest of the athletes on the village, uh, athletes village on the left. The point there is that, yes, there are porta potties in the village at the top, in the field at the top, but the bottom, that's all it is, is porta potties. Well, there's a couple of tables of water and Gatorade as well. But if you get on the bus, if you get off the bus on the left side in front of the schools, you can walk past that choke point and turn left to hit the porta potties there. And the lines generally are not as long. Most of the people are flowing to the fields at the right. Um, the exit to the start is at the top of this picture alongside the, middle, the Hopkinton Middle School. We're going to talk a little bit more about the exit to the start. So once you're in there, you eat, you drink, you queue up for the toilets. That's pretty much all you're doing <laughs> other than sitting. And you do want to bring something to sit on. The reason I say that is because especially if it was just morning dew or if there's been rain, or if there is snow, and there has been that in the past, there's nowhere to sit. Um, so you want to bring a towel, a heat sheet, an old heat sheet, something like that, a trash bag, something that you can jam into a pocket and then unfold um, and stick it on the ground. Some people just wear trash bags, and that's fine. It's very crowded at the exit. So when they call your way, when they call your corral, you have to be patient, but you do want to plan for delays on the way out. Then what do I mean about planning for delays? A lot of people, you'll hear, the, even going to the next one there, Kristen, you'll hear a lot of announcements throughout the morning. The announcers are saying, you know, welcome to the Athletes Village. Congratulations on being here. Right now, wave two is, is exiting. Wave, um, wave two corrals one, two, and three. It's time for you to go line up to leave. Four and five, you're going to go in five minutes and so on. So these announcements are happening. And you might be listening to this saying, well, my corral doesn't leave for 15 minutes. So I'm going to sit inside my nice blanket for another five minutes and then go get in line for the porta potty one more time. But you might be in that porta potty line for 25 minutes. And by that point, the corrals behind you have already started to line up to leave. And so your corral is already lined up and left. That's not a bad thing, but you do have to plan for the delays that are happening there. Um, and also, there are more toilets near the start. So you can, you can walk down the street, get near the start line, and there are a lot of them down there. So anyway, plan for delays. This guard closes as late as possible, especially if it's cold. Um, if it is cold, there are volunteers. Well, if it's cold, yes, you're wearing lots of sweatshirts, pants, and things. And this, again, it's all throwaway stuff. Once you've worn it on the bus out there, you're, you're not going to get it back unless you wear it back throughout the race. Um, there will be volunteers at the exit volunteers on Grove Street as you walk to the start, volunteers at the starting corral with two different kinds of bags. One is a trash bag and there are other volunteers with clothing bags and they'll be telling you clear bags are for clothes, dark bags are for trash or vice versa. I forget which is which. 
And uh, you can wear your clothes all the way into the starting corral if it's cold and then start disrobing. So you don't have to stop along the way. You'll see it right there where it says exit to start. People are, you know, taking off the sweatpants, taking off the sweatshirts, trying to get, you don't need to do that. You can wear it all the way down the street, get to the corral and then disrobe. And there are volunteers right there on the fence taking the clothing so you can wait until then. This is what it looks like in the Athletes Village on a nice pretty day, sunny, everybody sitting on the grass, enjoying meeting lots of thousands of new friends. So pretty day, that was 2016, I was there that year. I was also there this year, which was 2018, and it was miserable. It was cold, it was in the 30s, it was raining, it got rainier and wetter, <laughs> I mean, it got colder, and there was a headwind the whole way. And this is what it looked like. And this was the year I took another pair of shoes because walking through the athlete's village was literally a mud pit. And um, once you walked down on the street, your shoes were ruined. And so I changed my shoes when I got down to the Star Corral. I wore them all the way down the street. You're literally at the mercy of the wet. Again, you can't leave until your wave and corral are called. And um, there's the exit to the start from just north of the middle school. And there's the start line down there in Hopkinton. The distance is about three quarters of a mile from the exit to the start line. And that's the path that you take along Grove Street. You don't have to memorize it or know where it is because you just follow the people in front of you. So I mentioned there are more toilets down there in the CVS parking lot. And there are lots of them down there. There are the, where the corrals are <clears throat> along um, on that street along that runs perpendicular to Grove Street. <clears throat> So you just have to be patient. The walk takes about 15 to 20 minutes. And there's lots of, I mentioned, lots of volunteers collecting clothing and trash all along the way. You can move back to a different corral, but not up. And what I mean by that is, let's say you've got friends in corral, wave two, corral three, and you're in wave two, corral five, and y'all all want to run together. Well, they can move back to your corral five, but you can't move up to their corral by the same token. And I've done this with a friend in the past where I'm in wave three. I was literally in wave three, corral one, and she was in wave two, corral whatever. And she wanted to come run with me so she could move back to my wave, but I couldn't move up to her wave. However, if you move back from a wave to the wave behind you, you can't move to corral one. You have to go to corral two. So she came back to my wave and I had to move back to corral two to run with her. The reason for that is some people say, you know, I'm in wave one, corral eight. I'd rather be in the front. So I'm going to move back to wave two, corral one. They won't let you do that. You got to go back to corral two at, at the best. There's again the wave times and the corral times. These are not the times, of, the start times are on the right, but you can see you exit the village at, in an orderly fashion. So you don't have to know this. You don't have to write it down and memorize it. You just know as long as you get to the bus on time, <laughs> the appropriate time, once you're in the athletes village, they're constantly announcing these things. Wave two, corrals one and two, wave two, corrals three and four and so on. So just pay attention when you're out there. This is what the walk looks like from the athletes village to the start line along Grove Street. It's really cool. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's not so cool if it's raining on you, but it's a great on a good on a nice day. It's a great walk with lots and lots of friends around you. Um, don't do what I've seen some people doing, which is try to warm up on that run by running down Grove Street. It, it's way too crowded to jog and <laughs> warm up. So don't even try. Just walk along and be patient and you'll get there. Again, this is the start times waves one through four. We don't have to talk about it here. You'll see it all weekend long. Okay, now it's time for me to turn it over to Kristen to talk about the course. And uh, Kristen, far away, before I hand it over, reminding folks, if you got a question about anything, type it in the chat box and I'll be monitoring that and I'll interrupt and, and, and post that question for Kristen as we go along. So thanks. Thanks, Paul. So here we have the overview. This is the course map and the entire elevation map. Uh, we're going to break it down into segments, but I just want you to take a look at this. As you can see, it is uh, very rolly. 
Um, and uh, But overall downhill, and we're gonna go through it in detail. The course runs from west to east. And so you do wanna take a look at what direction the wind is blowing. Um, most often it's a headwind, um, but there was uh, one year in particular, 2011, which was historic for the tailwind. Uh, hopefully we get that, but you never know. Um, you do cross through eight different towns. I like to uh, check the towns off as I go through them. Um, it just sort of builds the anticipation. So the first town you start in is Hopkinton, then Ashland, Framingham, <clears throat> Natick, Wellesley, Newton, Brookline, and Boston is the finish. Along the course, there are plentiful aid stations. There's water and lemon lime endurance Gatorade. Uh, do note that that is the endurance formula, not standard Gatorade if you're practicing with this on your own um, at home, which you should be. Um, but those are every mile starting at mile two. And those aid stations are on both sides of the street. Uh, it's all the way except for one, I think it was mile 24, something like that. Um, and the aid stations are staggered. So you will see as you're running along, they'll be on the right hand side of the street first, and then they'll be on the left hand side. But you don't have to move, you don't have to worry about getting to an aid station because the aid stations will really come to you and they are really long um, with tons of volunteers. So don't go out of your way zigging and zagging to, to make your, you know, make a beeline to any aid station. Um, you don't really have to worry about that at this race. There are three gel stations on course and the, gel, the gels provided are Morton. They have two varieties. One is a caffeinated version, uh, which comes in a white package. So you can see it very distinctly. And the non-caffeinated version is black. Um, these are at three uh, mile points on the course, 11.8, mile 17, and mile 21.5. In my experience as well, um, they're, the gels are plentiful. Um, I'm in wave one and I usually take uh, one or two as I'm going through because I like to have um, an extra in case I, I drop one or I fumble uh, while I'm opening one. Um, so you don't have to really worry about, am I gonna get a gel? Um, they'll, they'll have plenty uh, for everyone. And those and, again- And by the same, Kristen, you had mentioned the aid stations are on both sides of the street. The same is true with the Martin gel stations. There are volunteers handing them out on both sides of the street. So when you see the volunteers handing out the Martin gels, you don't have to cross the street to get to them if you happen to be on the other side of the street just keep going and they'll pop up on the other side yes exactly okay so now we're going to go through breaking down the course and i'll go through all of the elevations and the uh, things you'll see along the way and things to look out for um overall the the course is a net downhill but as i mentioned there's a lot of climbing and you can see that there um Boston loses roughly 980 feet and it gains about 530 feet. So the net is uh, minus 450 feet. Um, there are a couple of different sources out there uh, with numbers. If you if you go and look it up, you'll see a little variation, but this is a, about the average. So I'm breaking the course up into the 5Ks. I personally like to navigate things and and make adjustments based on the 5Ks. I would not, this is not a course where I would worry about the mile by mile because a lot of these miles are gonna have uh, great variations. Some miles are almost all downhill and some miles will be almost all uphill. Um, and so you really wanna make sure your average over the over 5K uh, is is where you want it to be. So we're gonna start with the first 5K and there you can see it's in Hopkinton. The road here is very narrow and there's uh, two lanes only to start with absolutely no shoulder. And so everybody is really um, coming out of the corrals uh, right on top of each other with not a lot of elbow room. Uh, packed in tight, that's what I said. 
uh, I would not waste any energy trying to get around people. It's first of all, it's early in the race. You have, you know, 23 miles to go. So why would you burn up any energy uh, this early? You're going to need it later. Trust me on that. And also the course really does open up and you're going to get room. So um, there's, there's no, there's no point in, in, you know, trying to, you know, fight your way when you can just wait a little while and you'll have the room that you need. Um, one thing I would like to note, I do recommend if you are not planning to run anywhere near your seated time, the corrals are seated based on your uh, submitted BQ time. So everybody in, in your wave and your corral has run around the exact same time as you. Um, if you plan to run significantly slower, I would do yourself and everyone else a favor and, and move yourself uh, back voluntarily. Um, that's also so you don't, you know, so you don't get mowed down and so you don't, you know, block the path for, for other people, particularly if you're in the early waves. All right. So the, the course starts out right from the jump. You have a nice big downhill, 140 feet loss there from the starting line. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to fly out of the gate. Um, you don't want to fight it at any point. You just really want to go with it. Um, but you do also have a short uphill all in the first mile. So this is, this is a nice little cross section of what the entire course will be. You go down, you go up, you go down, you go up. Uh, and I have there the grades. So the, the steepest grade for the downhill in the beginning is a negative 5.7. And then the steepest grade for the uphill is a plus 5.2. So you give and you, you give and you take back. That's, that's a lot of this course. Um, then after you get through that first mile, it's generally downhill through the, all the way through the 5k mark, losing a hundred feet, hundred feet overall. All right. 5k to 10k. This is Ashland to Framingham. There it is on the map and there it is on the elevation. This section is gentle, gentle rollers. The, the road really twists and curves many times here. There are a few places where the course widens and they and uh, a concrete median will appear. Um, if you happen to be running right in the middle of the street, just be cognizant of that because you'll want to give yourself space to move over to either one side um, while also, you know, maintaining pace. It's, as I said, it's primarily two lanes all the way up until the 10K mark. That's where the Framingham train station is. That's where things really start to widen. And um, also, if you have spectators coming, that's a good place for them to come and cheer. Mile three to four loses about 50 feet. The steepest grade there is a minus 4.3%. And then there's a short uphill climb at mile 4.2. Uh, that's, you know, nothing too big, but it's a 3.8%. And then the course resumes a gentle roll up and down and up and down. Here we have Framingham to Natick, which is 10K to 15K. This is through Framingham, the business district, and the, the road really widens up here. There's a shoulder, there's um, additional turn lanes. And so, as I said before, if you're patient early on, you're, you're gonna get the space. And this is one of the, one of the first areas where you really get the space to, to move around and um, settle into your own pace. The crowds by the train station are plentiful. And so you get a nice boost there as you go through Framingham. Watch your footing at mile 6.5. There's train tracks that cross the course and you wanna just make sure you don't get tripped up there early on in the race. That's a picture of the Framingham train station and the spectators. And you can see there that people have some, some wiggle room to move. This is a picture of the train tracks. Like I said, they go diagonally across the street. Um, so they cross the entire street. So no matter where you're running on the road, you will cross those tracks. So make sure you pick your feet up. 
Let me this stop you for a him. moment there, Kristen. Mm -hmm. Hold on one second. There was a question that we go back to worry about what you started with. And the question comes, um, any tips for running around people who are a lot slower than you at the beginning? And I can answer this because I've done it. Uh, maybe going side to side, maybe going to the side. It, the, the question says, I got in as a non-time qualifier, so I'm in wave four. I too ran this once years ago uh, as a non-qualifier, as a charity runner. Um, um, I was actually invited by a friend of mine who had a charity. He said, we, we need runners. Would you please come run for our charity? I said, okay. So um, we started in the last wave and the last corral. <laughs> and both of us were previous Boston runners as time qualifiers. So we were way back with people who were going to run at least two hours slower than we were. And um, we we simply took our time. We bided our time until the crowds in, in, in front of us were beginning to thin out a little bit. And we would work our way around them. We didn't waste a lot of energy weaving in and around people because you, you, you find yourself just doing it constantly for the first mile up to maybe the first three miles where we did encounter a group and we're like, okay, we got to get around this. We would work our way to the side, just as you asked. We'd get over to the side and we'd wait until there was an intersection with another street or maybe a sidewalk suddenly appeared and we would work our way around the, the, a little bit of a crowd there. But the bottom line is we waited until it opened up after about four to five miles and definitely by framing him at the 10K mark, we waited until there. And in going back to what Kristen said, if you do plan to run slower than usual, and, and by the way, I usually do. I usually, lately I have been running Boston wow. about an hour slower than whatever time I qualified for because I just go and take it easy and just enjoy the day. And so I have moved back uh, in corrals and I've also decided I'm going to run way over to the side here and just kind of maintain my pace and just run very slowly. And I end up finding that I'm trailing people who are doing the same thing. We're sort of moving to the side and getting out of the way. So if you plan to run slower than normal, do that. Move to one side or the other and just stay there. And that's what I've done. Okay, back to you, Kristen. Okay, great. Uh, so we're looking at the uh, elevation here, framing him to Natick. This is the flattest section of the course. You should really enjoy this part because this is the only part like this. There will, there's no other part like this. The best 5K you're gonna have. <laughs> I recommend uh, you, you really settle into your pace here and be and be really dialed into to what you want to do. Uh, don't go any faster uh, in this section, but um, you know, run your own race there. All right, Natick, 15K to 20K. The surroundings change here. It's really a small, quaint little town, Natick. It's it's a uh, it's pretty New England cute. Uh, mile nine, uh, you pass a lake and there's a pond on your right, and then mile twelve, there's uh, two additional ponds um, through Natick uh, Common. That that's at mile ten. Uh, there's a church and uh, the real small town feel there. Uh, not a lot of crowds, but you know there there is support al along the entire route. Um, you enter Wellesley at mile eleven point six, and Wellesley is the largest section of the of the course in terms of towns. Uh, by mile twelve, you can already hear the scream tunnel, which is well ahead of you, but it's so loud you can hear it for a long way before you arrive there. There's a steady rolling rise at mile 11.25 and the course climbs about 50 feet over that mile um, and, and a quarter. Then there's a rolling drop to mile 13 and mile 11.25 to 12.75 uh, loses about 70 feet overall there. All right, Natick to Wellesley. This is when you get into Wellesley interruption. proper. Yes. One more interruption before we get on to Wellesley, which is definitely an exciting part of the course. Uh, was a question, where did we get our corral number? Uh, you go to your entry list. The BAA website has an entry list where you can go to the Athletes Village where you check your own number and they've now posted your, your corral number. So I just looked at mine. It tells me I'm in wave three, corral three. 
So you can go and see where you're on, in, put your own name or bib number, and it'll tell you what wave and corral number you're in. It'll also be when you pick up your packet, it'll be on your bib. It will have your wave and your, <laughs> the wave is your bib number color, and it will have a number on there and it'll tell you what corral you're in. Okay. Now we're going to go through Wellesley. As I mentioned, the Scream Tunnel, I think probably everybody's heard of it because it is one of the most famous sections of the course, and there's really nothing else like it. That is absolutely true. Um, if you want to, you know, partake in all of the Wellesley drama, then you should stay to the right side. High fives, kisses, you name it, you can get that over there to the right side. If you want to avoid it a little bit, you can uh, move over to the left. The left side is uh, the, where the commuter rail run, lay, uh, commuter rail line runs. And so it's just wooded over there. There's no nobody on that side. Um, make sure you keep your pace in check here. It's very, very easy to get carried away and you won't even notice it. It is just the energy and the um, the hype that's surrounding you. It's really it's really hard to not get caught up in it. So I do recommend everybody check their watch here as they're going through and make sure they're not speeding up too much. These are pictures of uh, the Scream Tunnel itself. As you can see, tons of people like, and they're going crazy. They are yelling and nonstop, you know, like waving their hands, signs everywhere. Um, you can get kisses, high fives, anything uh, you want, or you can just, you know, enjoy that energy and, and keep going up to you. This is what the elevation looks like. It's, there's not much until you get all the way through Wellesley, uh, past the college, through Wellesley, the town center itself, and you're leaving Wellesley. Keep in mind, when you leave Wellesley, that's when the action really starts. There is a huge drop here. This is 118 feet down. It is pretty dramatic. You will actually be able to see it as you're running. You, you will see it before you it it it's visible uh, downhill. And uh, the steepest grade there is a negative 5.2%. Right uh, after you do this huge downhill is when the five miles of climbing commences. So it's directly after. So use that, uh, use this point as a transition. Mentally, you wanna prepare yourself before you get into the Newton Hills. Um, I would certainly take advantage of this downhill here. Um, and, you know, go with it because you have a really hard section ahead. All right, Newton. This is, as mentioned, the hard section. This is all climbing. The Newton Hills, uh, there are four of them. Heartbreak Hill is the fourth one. Most everybody's heard of Heartbreak Hill, but there are actually four hills total in this section, and they're all in this section. There are they are all challenging really in their own right and they come in succession and late in the race. So that's what one of the aspects that really makes it um, a lot more difficult than simply just climbing a hill, right? You know, if you have one hill, you go up it, it's tough, but you're, you're over it. Um, this is really hill, 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 hill. We're gonna break it down and so you know what to expect, um, but you have to prepare yourself for all four of them, right? Not just one. The hills each have their own name. Washington Hill is the first, Braeburn Hill is the second, John Kelly Hill is the third, and Heartbreak Hill is the fourth one, the last one. They uh, each have their own uh, grade and distance. Uh, we're gonna break them down uh, by feet as well, but this is the overall uh, percentage grades. The first one there, Washington Hill, is a 2.2%. Uh, and af over uh, a little over uh, half of a mile, it climbs 75 feet. So really not too bad on its own, right? That's Everybody can do a hill like that. But you have the next one here, Brayburn Hill, which is incredibly steep. Uh, it's just over a quarter of a mile long and you climb 75 feet. So that's quite dramatic. Uh, it's a 4.1% grade. 
And again, these are coming back to back to back. So there is some time to recover in between, but not a lot. This third hill, John Kelly Hill, you're back to a 2% grade, just over a half of a mile, a 63 foot climb. And then Heartbreak Hill is the fourth hill and it is back to a 4% grade, uh, just over a half of a, um, half of a mile climb there. Uh, hey, real quick, Kristen, we got a couple of questions um, and I have a comment about, um, about these hills. Uh, the, one of the questions is, and this is a good question for everyone, what's going on with the BAA.org racing app? It's not on the Apple App Store. It's re-released every year. So it will be the new, the 2023 app will be released sometime in the next week or so is my guess. So every year it, it essentially doesn't work anymore and you delete the old one and you get the new one. Uh, and a question about, is our age anywhere on the bib? No, you don't. The bib number does not have your age anywhere on it. So you don't you don't know. No one knows your age and you don't know the age of anyone you're running alongside about these hills. The first turn on the course, when you started the race, you go more than 17 miles before the first turn. Um, and that's in Newton where these hills are. The first that first climb at 16 miles, it's literally right at the 16 mile marker and you can see it coming because you hit the 16 mile marker and you've been running down out of Newton towards Newton Lower Falls and you see the hill climbing ahead of you to go over highway. Then you keep on going through the town in, into Newton. And then as you're approaching mile seven, after you've passed mile 17, you come to the very first turn on the course and it's the turn at the Newton Firehouse. And there's usually an enormous crowd there. And you're about to climb the second hill, which in my opinion is the hardest hill, the second of Brayburn Hill. But you make that turn at the fire station, big crowds there, and then you start this second climb, and then on you go towards the third and fourth climbs. Okay, that's it. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, each of the hills uh, do allow some recovery after. Um, I personally like to... Uh, really concentrate on just tackling one at a time as I'm doing them. Um, so, you know, don't worry about Heartbreak Hill when you're trying to go over that highway overpass, you climb a highway overpass and there's a hospital on the other side. Um, you know, don't worry about what's ahead. Don't worry about the turns. Don't worry about any of that. Just worry about, I have to get through this one section right now, one foot in front of the other and tackle them one by one by one. And then, um, because you know it can be really overwhelming if you try to think of it all in that particular moment. So uh, you know, just break it down one foot in front of the other. I just have to get up to the top of this one and then I'm gonna recover on the down and I'm gonna recover in between and set myself up for the next one. So that's how I recommend doing it um, one bite at a time. This is a picture of, uh, this is several pictures of Heartbreak Hill. Um, there's a lot of support through all of the Newton Hills. And really I recommend using the crowds uh, to help you here. They're, they're there specifically because they know this section is hard. And um, so use all of that, so all of the support that you can get. Uh, I have a picture here I, I wanna make note of. Um, this banner that's over the top of Heartbreak Hill uh, and it says, congrats on summoning Heartbreak Hill. Uh, I love that. And you can see that that banner, it's it's really big. It's across the entire road. And so, you know, I use that uh, to draw myself in and really just concentrate on um, on just getting to it. You know, like it's it's it will not take you that long to get up up to it. So, you know. Um, use the visuals and the crowds around you to, to push yourself through this section. You will slow down. You absolutely should slow down here. Um, but again, you need to use the downhills for the recovery and the downhills to make up the time that you're losing on these climbs. Also a comment about heart, uh, not just heartbreak, but these other hills. Uh, I've run this, this course 11 times and I've, run all four of the hills without stopping maybe twice at some point in those hills i stop and walk up 
a little part of it. Um, so if, if, if you will see a lot of people walking, especially on heartbreak, but even the hills before that, not so much the first one or even the second one, but by the time you get to that third one, and especially on heartbreak, you begin to see lots of people walking up the hill for numbers of reasons. Either they're tired out or they think, you know, I'm just going to enjoy this walk and high five all the neighbors who are out cheering me on. For whatever reason, there are a lot of people walking up these hills. And if you have to stop and walk up the hill, that's perfectly fine. You don't need to feel like you're compelled to run the entire way. Now, if you're racing the route like Kristen has done and you're trying to PR in Boston, okay, you can't really walk up any of these hills. You can't really afford to walk anywhere on this course. But if you're like me and you're just going to go out and enjoy the day and, you know, enjoy the dessert that is Boston for the hard work that you did to get there, then by all means, walk as much of the hills as you need. Back to you, Chris. Yeah, I hope, you know, there's different ways to run any kind of race, right? There's different motivations. So, you know, use your judgment on what you're there for and, uh, you know, what you're trying to get out of the day, right? All right, so we're on to the next section, Brookline to Boston. This is when it starts to get exciting because you know you're getting close to the finish and the crowds will be there out in force. Uh, as you crest Heartbreak Hill, the course starts a downhill turn and it starts right away. Your legs are really very fatigued by this point, first of all, because you're past the, the 21 mile mark uh, of the marathon. So that's hard no matter what, no matter what the course is, uh, you're gonna be in pain at that point. But it's most especially for this race because your legs are going to take a beating. Uh, there is a lot of pounding on this race. I think uh, this is one race where I've been the most sore ever at the end. So uh, don't be surprised if you have those jelly legs or the, uh, I like to say baby deer legs. Uh, watch your footing when you are making the turn into Cleveland Circle. I'm gonna show you a picture of what that looks like. Uh, but just know, especially when you're tired, it's hard to pick up your feet, but you really wanna pick up your feet there. Uh, the Boston College crowds rival Wellesley. In my, in my opinion, they top Wellesley um, because for a couple of reasons. One is that you will reach them later in the day and they have been drinking for several more hours. And so they are really, uh, <laughs> they're really excited by that point. Um, and uh, also uh, they're just, uh, the crowd is, is a little more packed uh, because it is later in the race. And this is a section where if you have spectators, they can get to you uh, on the tee. And so it's a, it's a, it's a really easy spot, uh, for your people to come and, and watch you and cheer you. This is a picture of, as I mentioned, that's that downhill as you're going right by Boston college. Uh, the picture here on the right is of the elite women. Uh, and you can see they have, they still have some good form there. They have, uh, you know, a nice uh, angle in relation to the, the, the downhill of the course. The gentleman uh, in the picture over on your left uh, is doing some serious overstriding. And so you want to make sure you're not doing that overstriding because it is going to make your quads and everything hurt uh, 10 times more. Uh, so really on the downhills, it's short step, short, uh, quick steps and um, lean into the hill. Don't lean back. This is a picture of what I was describing for before in Cleveland Circle. Um, so you pass Boston College, you go by the cemetery there. It's going to be on your right hand side and in a little pond. And then you will uh, come down a hill. This is again, downhill here, and you make a turn, um, uh, you make a left-hand turn. And this, uh, the picture there is what the tracks actually look like. As you can see, it's several tracks crisscrossing in various ways. So again, watch your feet, watch and make sure you, you don't trip yourself up, especially here at mile, you know, 22. You don't want to be taking a face plant. 
so you can see here, as I said before, this is downhill, very downhill. 200 uh, feet are lost um, between from mile 21 to mile 24. These are rollers, but uh, it's overall downhill. The steepest grade here, as I mentioned, is right when you come up to the, the crest of Heartbreak Hill, and that's a 5% uh, downhill grade. Watch your form. I said that, but I'll say it again. Watch your form. Then the sit go sign comes right up uh, around mile 25, and that's a really great uh, beacon and landmark to, you know, to um, uh, fix your gaze to. And after you pass the that sit go sign, you only have a mile to go. So really, you are done, uh, nearly done at that point. And this is what it looks like. There is a climb up to the sit go sign. You uh, cross over the the highway there, and and so. You're going to need that sign to get you up over that that climb there. This is what it looks like when you get closer to it. This is a uh, Ken, Kenmore Square. Uh, if you're interested, uh, the marathon photos, marathon uh, photographers will be there out in force. So make sure you put on a, a nice smile, even though you're hurting. Uh, this is Boston, the final part of the race. There are additional climbs here, three of them. They are from mile 25 to the finish. One is over the Mass Turnpike. Then, there, then you go under Mass uh, Ave, and then you climb up Hereford uh, to Boylston for that final turn uh, as you um, race to the finish. The turn on, once you've made that turn onto Boylston, it's 600 meters to the finish line. So you really are um, in the home stretch there once you've made that famous turn. This, these are the three climbs. As you can see, they are not big at all. 15 feet for the first one, 10 feet for the second, and five feet for the, the third. But uh, your legs are really uh, beat up from all of that downhill and the climbing and the back and forth uh, on the... Muscular level, uh, the fatigue is is high here, and it's also at miles 25 and miles 26 of a marathon. So they're not big, but they feel huge. And uh, make sure you you know take them again one by one as you're going. This is the picture of the first one, as 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 I showed you before on that climb uh, with the sit go sign. This is the second one. You are following that car that goes under Mass Ave. And this is what the third one looks like. This is uh, as you make the right-hand turn on Hereford. Um, it is uphill. It's really slight, but um, the crowds here will be um, really thick on both sides, like six, six people deep. So this is one of those sections where I just... I don't even pay attention to the road or what's a, what's going on ahead of me. And I just use the, the, the spectators to get me through it. This is a picture of Hereford in 2018. And Paul can tell you about what that was like. Yes, I ran Boston in 2018, which was the, the bad rain, cold headwind. And um, I wore significant amount of gear the entire way. Lots of folks finished. Their finisher photos looked like the woman you see in the middle of the photo there, 18362, whatever that number is. And folks said to me, how did people run 26 miles in that weather dressed like that? And my answer was, they didn't. They ran about 600 meters dressed that way. Maybe a, maybe a little more, maybe half a mile more. And what happened was people were dressed like this, the guy you see behind her in the yellow poncho, most of the way. And then they made the right hand turn onto Hereford. And right before they turned left onto Boylston Street, they started ditching the rain ponchos, the jackets, you name it. So I made this run up Hereford Street. And after 26 miles of running or right at 26 miles of running, it's really hard hop over things in the road, <laughs> especially when your whole body's frozen. 
So we had to run around these things. The point, the lesson here is two, two lessons. One, if you're wearing stuff like this, do everybody else a favor and ditch your stuff at the side of the road, not the middle of the street. And two, if you, uh, if you find yourself running through this sort of landmine, you just have to slow down and take it easy and weave your way in and around this stuff because it, it is very easy to think that you're about to hop that poncho and you don't quite make it and you you end up face down on Hereford Street right before your nice finish down Boylston Street. So just be careful, right? This is the famous turn. Uh, every time I go to Boston, I take a picture of these street signs. <laughs> I don't know why I need, you know, five pictures of the same street signs, but I have them anyway. Uh, the right on Hereford, left on Bo Boylston. There will be uh, photographers there right at the corner. So if you want a nice picture, again, that's another place to put your biggest smile on. This turn is huge because as you, as soon as you make that uh, left on Boylston, you can see the finish line ahead of you. It's a straight line uh, shot. This is a picture of what it looks like. As I said before, it's 600 meters from when you make that turn. So you still have a good ways to go, but you can see the finish line ahead of you. And the energy here is off the charts. Um, there's there it it's it's building as you get closer to Boston, but this is the real, this is the the you know the crescendo at the at the end. This is this is the height of it, and so all of that energy that you had building up is is really coming coming out tenfold here. Uh, you can see here from the picture uh, there there is still you know a several people around you in most cases when you're finishing. Um, but if you have any spectators, uh, make sure you, you you get yourself to the side if you want to if you want to see them close up. The finish line, nothing more exciting than crossing the finish line of a marathon. Um, the Boston Marathon finish line is is really one of the most exciting uh, finish finish lines I think you'll ever you'll ever cross in your life. So make sure you enjoy it and take it all in. Uh, this is a quote from Jack Daniels. I'm not going to read it. You can read it on your own. But basically, this is his pacing strategy, which is, you know, what I say overall, which is don't fight the course, use the course to your advantage and take what the course is, is giving you. And uh, so work with the course and pacing. Don't work against it. Paul's going to go over everything else. Go back one slide there, Kristen. I want to mention this this photo you were just showing. Um, this is the Charles Gate Bridge, which is about mile 25 and a half. You're just about to go under um, Mass Ave, <clears throat> so that you're 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 inside the last mile here. And this was I don't know what year this was, but you can see it's very sunny, and you can see that there are a number of people walking. Gentleman right on your left, he's holding his back. I've been there many many times. And so I, if I have to, I walk through this stretch because my body has just been through a lot the first 25 plus miles. And I want to feel good running down Boylston Street, not necessarily look good for the photos, but just feel good and enjoy it. So if I'm feeling like, you know, I'm, I'm about to pass out here or I'm about to get a hamstring cramp, then I take a brief walk through here before I finish. And by the way, I did in 2014, I think that's the shirt I have on today. I did try a little bit of a sprint in the last 100 meters, and I ended up with a hamstring cramp, and I came across the finish line limping with a, with a hamstring cramp holding onto it. So if you have to take a break before that last run on Boylston Street, this is the place to do it. Oh, and it's my turn now, anyway, mm -hmm. since I was talking there. Okay, so when you finish the race, your day is not done, obviously, but your work is not done either. You can see the finish line on the left side of this photograph where it says finish line, right? And then you keep walking. You go through water, metals, heat sheets, blankets, food, and everything. And then you come to the gear check buses, which, which is where you dropped off your bags earlier in the morning. It is a long walk, and it's very crowded. So just like this morning, 
or earlier in the morning, rather, when you were walking to the start, it's wall to wall people. And you're, you, nobody's in a real hurry anyway. Nobody's really walking very well anyway. Just expect it to take a while. So if you're planning to meet people, tell them, look, from the time that I cross the finish line until the time that I meet you at wherever you're going to meet them, they can plan on 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes by the time you get there. Because this is a this is a long, crowded walk from the finish line through all of this area, all the way to gear check and so on. But anyway, there's where gear check is. And then your exits, you got to get out. There are officially three options. The first one is at the top near Newberry Street. That's where I went out last year. I went out, I got my gear, my gear um, somewhere down whichever bus it was. And then I walked out on Newberry Street and headed west <clears throat> back towards the, the um, back towards my hotel. The second exit is down there by the family meeting area. And there's actually two sides on two, two different sides of the street. And the third one is on St. James Street over towards Copley Square. The least crowded one is the one on Newberry Street. The most crowded one is the one towards the family meeting area. And the one on, on, on St. James is also very crowded. If you're going to take the T somewhere, closest stations are Arlington over at Arlington and Boylston Street. And the back bay exit, which is the orange and the back bay station, which is on the orange line. <clears throat> the family meeting area. Important thing here. Uh, a couple of years early in the race, I did plan to meet family there. The way that they do it is their sign, their street signs that is alphabetical. And you know, my last name is Carmona, so I meet people over in C. That was a mistake because. <laughs> It's so crowded there. It's extremely crowded. It's so crowded that you can't really get through very easily. So since then, I made plans to meet people in other places away from the family meeting area. And so I avoid that area as much as possible. I've met in the past, I've met either over at the entrance to the Weston Hotel. And why the entrance? Because it was 2018 and it was ju I just swam through freezing water for 26.2 miles. And we went into the Weston Hotel entrance because that was the first place to get into the Prudential Center Mall. So I could get indoors uh, very quickly. That's one place to meet. Over on Newberry Street, I mentioned that one. That's where I went last year. Um, exited Newberry Street, exit and walked left, turned to the left and um, met with my wife up there. Um, the third area is over at near the Arlington T Station. There's sometimes, I don't know if it'll happen this year, but in sometimes at the very end of that street, I mean, they're in the very end of Boylston Street at Arlington Street, there's sort of a secret exit for runners to get out because you just went through gear check and there were lots and lots of runners behind you walking towards you to the buses. And if you go all the way down that street, there's sometimes a volunteer and a police officer there say, yeah, you can get out here, you just can't get back in. So there might be an exit there. And if you take that exit, you can have people meet you at Arlington um, and Boylston Street there. Or you can exit Newberry Street, take a right, and then walk back down towards the Boston Commons. So if you're staying at hotels on that side of, Boyle, of the finish area, like the Park Plaza or any of the other hotels in that direction, good spot to meet is right there at the corner of Arlington and Boylston. And oh, by the way, if you just say, meet at the corner of Arlington and Boylston, that's not good enough. You have to see, say, meet at the southeast corner of Arlington and Boylston or the northwest corner of <laughs> because there's so many people around and all the runners kind of look alike with our heat sheets on. It's really hard to find people. So you have to be very specific and say, we're going to meet on this corner, northeast, southwest, northwest, whatever, of these two streets in front of the Starbucks or whatever, like that's the you gotta be very, very specific. Otherwise, you wander around for a while looking for people. All right. Okay. Well, this is a picture of what the start looks like, in case you were wondering. And I also put this quote from um Abby Birdfoot. Bird, oh, did I say that wrong? I think I did. Uh, but Birdfoot. he <laughs> <laughs> he was the Boston Marathon winner in 1968, and he also like comes back every year and speaks. So if you want to hear him speak, I recommend that. Um, but he says that winning has nothing to do with racing. Most days don't have races anyway. 
Winning is about struggle and effort and optimism and never, ever giving up. And I like that as a, as a quote for this race, because um, you really are, you know, as any of us, we've all completed marathons um, and none of them are easy, right? Uh, that's, that what, that's what makes it great. And uh, so you should expect to struggle and you should expect to have a few um, low points, uh, but never give up. That's, that's, really, that's really the takeaway here. By the way, go back to that photo there, Kristen, that, um, that view of the star, that's, those are white bibs, that's wave two. So this is wave two, corral one. And you can see behind these runners are about maybe 8,000 more runners in this wave, 9,000 more runners in this wave. Um, and so this is how crowded it is for the first, definitely for the first two miles, wall to wall people. As you can see, that's a two lane road and it's that crowded for the first couple of miles, three miles, it starts to get a little bit less congested, miles four, five, and six, but it's not until Framingham that it really opens up. That's why the recommendation was, if you're in a crowd this thick, there's no way to weave around people. You just kind of go with the flow. And by the same token, if you're going into this race as I have before, and as I am this year, knowing I qualified with X time, but I'm injured and I can't run that speed, you're going to be running with people to your left, to your right, in front of you and behind you who are going to be who have qualified at the same speed you qualified. And a lot of them are trying to run that speed, speed or faster that day. So it's easy to get swept up with the speed of the people around you. If you know you can't really do that, then it's best to move back a uh, corral or two or four or to a whole other wave just so that you can give your, do yourself a favor and not get stuck with being surrounded with all these people are essentially carrying you along at a speed that you can't absolutely can't run. Okay. Yeah. One more thing I'll say about the start as well. Um, only, only each wave has its own start, right? So the co individual corrals do not have their own start. Um, they are basically, once you hear that gun for your wave, people around you are going to start moving. Even if you're all the way back in like, the back of your wave, corral seven or eight, um, which is the very back of each wave, they are going to start moving because the, the front of the line is gonna go out and you, you're gonna be carried along with them. So you wanna make sure you have any throwaways or anything that you plan to toss, you wanna have those off. When that start time, when the gun time is, um, there is also a little bit of a hill to climb up if you're starting towards the back of the corrals, um, five, six, seven, and eight. And uh, several people around you will actually jog up the hill because they're just so anxious to get started. Um, you don't have to, you can walk, but uh, once you uh, cross that line, people are gonna you know, shoot across like, uh, like their hair's on fire for the most part. Uh, that's been my experience. So, um, you know, do be ready for that. Don't, don't be caught off guard trying to tie your shoe. Uh, that would be, that would be bad timing on your part. Yeah. But by the same token, what you can do is, is you can, I, I, this year I'm in wave three, corral three, and I have been dealing with a recent injury that I, I know that I can't run the speed that I've run to run to qualify to get there. So I might move all the way back to the last wave of my corral and just wait till everybody goes, just let it clear out in front of me and then say, okay, now I'm going to start because it's chip time and I'm not racing it anyway. So I'll wait till the entire road clears in front of me and then say, oh, look, it's almost as if I'm by myself out here and then just go then. So there's no hurry. Again, if you're racing and you want to, you know, move along at a good clip, more power to you. If you're just out there to enjoy the day and enjoy the pageantry and the crowds, and just move back, take it easy, let everybody go, and then you can go. Yes, more than one way to do it for sure. Mm -hmm. Probably, probably even more than two ways. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is now we have here our email address. If you want to email us any personal questions, you can certainly do that if you have things that you wanna address about your specific strategy or your specific circumstances, we're happy to answer those questions. 
Um, but if you have any other uh, things that we haven't addressed um, earlier in this, you're welcome to ask those now as well. Yeah, here's a question that's been asked, Kristen, and, and I think you're the best person to answer it because it, it applies to you or an experience that you have done. And it's, I'll be running faster than my wave, meaning faster than the time he qualified. Any comments or any suggestions? That's not for me to answer because I've never done it. But you have. You qualified, and then you ran Boston faster than your qualifying time. In fact, you mentioned you ran your PR at Boston just last year. So what is your suggestion on running faster than the people around you? Well, in my experience, um, as I said before, it, in wave one anyway, um, the red wave, the, the people around me uh, were going out like, uh, like gangbusters. And I do not want to start a marathon uh, in any way, shape or form, uh, like gangbusters. I, I want to ease my way into it. That's, that's what I like to do. And especially for this race, because there are, uh, all of those significant climbs, they come after, uh, the halfway point. So you really want to save some energy for the later half of the race. Um, and so my strategy there is to, is to really, ease my way into it. And I had people going around me, even though we were all running, um, even though I ended up passing them later, I passed them later when they were, you know, struggling up the hills, I was running past them when they were, you know, walking through the um, aid stations uh, by the sit go sign in Kenmore Square, I was running past them. So my personal recommendation there is to bide your time and and wait for your opportunity um but most of the people that are you know trying to pr not not everybody but a lot of them will be running off the line uh like they're out for a 10k and it's not a 10k it's a marathon so that yeah. well to, to to put a finer point on it the suggestion i would make to you on that issue is to just run with your wave just go with the flow know that you're going to be picking up the speed later and the, the the place to be running faster than your qualifying speed is not in the first four to five miles anyway it's that's it's not there it's and especially not in the first mile so as the race is beginning and you're running with people around you you're thinking okay the, i'm 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 i want to be running faster than this that's great but just go with the flow go with the pace you'll find yourself running comfortably along for a mile or two, and then gradually start to increase your pace through miles three, four, five. And by the definitely by the time you've passed the first 10K, now you can lock in on what your what your goal pace is for that day. Moving on to another question about pacing. Should you aim to do the first and second half generally at the same time? Or is it a lost cause with the Newton Hills? I'll answer first and then Kristen get your thoughts on it. My experience is it's definitely for most people. It's definitely a positive split course. You're going to run, even if you run conservatively the first half, that conservative effort is good to, to save the energy for the second half when the Newton Hills appear. But the Newton Hills slow you down enough that you are going to slow down and then pick up the speed again to get back on pace for the last five miles. But it's going to slow you down enough that you're going to end up with a positive, slip, uh, positive split, even if it's just a small one. Having said that, I have coach runners who have done a negative split on this course. And I'm thinking specifically a runner I coached who was aiming for a 330. And I told her to run exactly 145, eight, just keep it at eight minutes a mile for the first half. And then when she hits Wellesley, to then pick up what she can and, and see if she can gradually increase her pace and hold on to that through Newton. And she ran a 140 to the second half and ended up with a 327 or so for the day. So I think that math works out 145 and 143. Yeah, she's 142. So she did run a negative split that day. So it is possible to do it, but it it's it's not easy. Yeah. Kristen, what do you think? I I I would I like to say aim for a negative split effort, but I don't think 
pace wise, the numbers really uh, work out like that for the most part, um, because as mentioned, there is so much climbing later and the first half uh, is is really downhill and, and flat, more so than, than the later part of the race. And, and just to, and speaking strictly from the, per, from the perspective of biomechanics, if you maintain a generally an even effort throughout the race, the same effort from miles one through 26, because of gravity, you're going to go faster the first half than the second. And the, the miles 16 to 21 through Newton are just going to necessarily slow you down. And then it will be very difficult to make up that time in the last five miles. So even at a plain old even effort pace, you're going to run a little bit slower in the second half than the first half, which is okay. Okay, yeah. let me see. There's another comment that says, it just says, it's great stuff. See you both at the Sunday group picture. One point to make. Use the second entrance inside the Prudential building to gain entrance into the expo versus the street side, less crowded. Yeah, that was a point I made earlier. Or the point I was talking about earlier, there's two entrances to the expo, the Boylston street side and the Prudential center entrance, basically the mall entrance. The mall entrance is far less crowded. And another point I didn't make at the time uh, about the expo was that there are metal detectors. So if you have a, and there are, so you have to go through metal detector, number one, but also they search bags. So if you're carrying a backpack, a purse, a satchel, anything like that, you have to stop, go to the table, they poke through your bag, and then they let you go through the metal detector. If you don't have a bag, you can just bypass the line at the bag check, bag search table and just go straight to the metal detector so when you go to the expo you're going to be coming out with a bag right <laughs> your, your pocket um so go in without a bag come out with a bag and you'll move through a lot faster and definitely use the prudential center side not the boylston street side okay uh i interrupted you on that pacing will you finish on that on the answer to that question Kristen? <clears throat> oh i was gonna say um there I think most of us know the difference between pushing and and you know easing in easing uh, through the course or going through it. And so early on, I like everybody to go with it and not push on the downhills. There is a time to push on the downhills, and that's after you've crest a uh, heartbreak hill. Um, and so really, the time to push does not come until mile 21 uh, in this course, um, but early on, you can run um, a little bit under marathon pace because you're going, you are going downhill, but the effort is not in that. You're just rolling with it. You're not, you're not trying to push. You're just going with, with what it is. So again, um, you know, your, your first half and second half will probably come out to positive splits, but it should be relatively close. Um, you know, and you're, you really don't want to push on the early downhills. Very good. Okay. Well, Kristen, listen, we are at almost 90 minutes of this presentation and you might have some, I know you've got some closing comments. Um, I definitely want to say good luck to everybody and congratulations again for running the Boston Marathon. I know not everybody who here here who not everyone here has qualified to get into Boston. But even if you didn't qualify, you're running the Boston Marathon, and you're no less of a Boston Marathoner than anybody else. For those of you who did qualify to get here, many of you worked very hard to get into the Boston Marathon, either the first time or the tenth time. Either way, for everybody, if this is your first Boston or your tenth Boston you don't know if this is your last Boston or your only Boston, right? And so enjoy every every minute of it, especially when you make that left-hand turn onto Boylston Street, turn on your brain recorder to record that experience. I've always told runners over the past 19 years that I've coached runners, marathoners, is there are, there's three things that you will only feel once. And it's the fit, your first marathon finish, you can finish lots more later, but you only have one feeling of, wow, I just finished my first marathon. And the second one is the first time you qualify for Boston. You might be as thrilled the 10th time you did it, but the first time you do it, it's this overwhelming sense of, wow, look at the accomplishment that I just did. And the third one is your first Boston marathon finish. 
you will never experience your first Boston Marathon finish again. You might finish 10, 12 more times, but never the first time again. So enjoy that. So remember those three things. But as it pertains to this presentation, remember your, your Boston Marathon finish. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, as I as mentioned in the beginning, this will be posted so you can also review it again if you like. Uh, it'll be on YouTube and I'll share the link. And if you're in the club or if I'm coaching you privately, uh, there will be several meetups throughout the weekend, uh, pasta dinner and also shakeout and also post-race party. So make sure you contact me or just show up to those. Uh, those events are shared already. And uh, I look forward to seeing everybody that weekend. And I hope it's a, it's a great weekend uh, for everyone. It's, it's my favorite race. So I think you'd have to actually work hard to not have a good time, but uh, you know, definitely make sure you, you take advantage of, of everything that, that's available that weekend. I agree. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Kristen.